Hi everyone, hope you're all well. This is the second screencast for History 115G, and it will discuss the history of birth control in the 19 teens and 20s. It is intended in part to give you context for the assigned document by birth control reformer Mary Ware Dennett. And if you don't have that document from Foster in front of you, you might want to hit pause and go get it because it would be useful to be able to look at it. So first of all, some background. You'll recall from earlier in the semester that the Comstock laws, which were this series of federal and state initiatives manning the circulation of information about anything deemed obscene, had been in effect since the 1870s. They were still the law of the land in the early 20th century and would remain that way for quite some time. Uh, and again, they didn't just, to, just to get rid of or ban things that were information about sex or pleasure. They also banned basic information about the human body. And note in the bottom uh, point that this didn't just mean things that you sold. It could be a drawing you did. It could be a pamphlet you handed to a friend. It could include personal documents. We don't have a lot of records of them going after people's diaries, but letters were fair game, and many birth control reformers would, in fact, become uh, pulled into this law and punished for responding to letters from people who they thought were, you know, genuine letter writers requesting information about birth control. Um, so look at the provisions here and think about how broad these are because that is crucial to understanding the fate of reformers and the birth control movement for quite some time. Now, a second background piece you want to remember here, also from earlier in the semester, has to do with the legacies of the Great War or World War I. The war would shake the Comstock laws uh, up a little bit. Think back again to when I covered the Great War, and you'll remember that a common response to the America's initial entry was calls for chastity and purity, and there was an associated legislative clampdown on the sexual behavior of soldiers abroad and in camps, and also of civilians at home, especially civilian women. However, at the same time that that was happening, some military authorities allowed, and others even encouraged, the use of condoms by soldiers to ensure their ability to keep fighting. What was going on here is that during wartime, um, this was the, the spread of venereal disease was framed as a public health crisis. And as we know from the current moment, things happen legislatively during pandemics and health crises that previously would have been unthinkable. So during wartime, the focus was on keeping male soldiers healthy. So the wartime conversation was primarily about condoms, as we see on the right, as a way of preventing disease. There wasn't really a wartime focus on contraception for non-procreative intercourse. Uh, that's partly because, as D'Amelio and Friedman spell out, condoms during this period were thought of as something that was solely about preventing venereal disease transmission. Respectable middle class or working class men would really not have ever felt like it was okay to hand their wife or girlfriend or sweetheart a condom. They were, they were sort of only for use with prostitutes. I'm not saying people didn't know that condoms also prevented, ideally, um, impregnation and pregnancy and were never used for that, but kind of semi-officially, they were solely for uh, preventing VD. But no matter what their use, the fact that the military itself was in some cases encouraging this and breaking the law meant that you could not put that genie back in the bottle. Every time a military commander or physician handed out condoms, and every time a soldier took them and used them, they were breaking the law. And so one of the effects of U.S. participation in the Great War was the repeated violation of the Comstock laws. And to some extent, this opened up room after the war for the public discussion of contraceptives. So this wartime trend towards greater uh, openness about contraception runs smack into something else that we need to understand and that is changes in family size. A bunch of times during the semester, we've looked not only at how families got smaller at the numbers, but we've explored changes in family size and the reasons why that happened. Because even in the absence of modern effective contraception, 
the quote unquote average American family in terms of the number of children it has varies greatly. During the long 18th century, you'll remember, family size across Europe and the United States grew dramatically, and this reflected an expansion of available industrial jobs. And as historian Apolov argues, it also was connected to the centering of heterosexual intercourse, so-called, as the primary and privileged sexual activity. Now, as we move into the 20th century, something very different is going to happen. The size of the family will drop, again, quickly and dramatically. Why? Some of the things that I covered in the first screencast are relevant here. More people are better off. People are living in cities, so there's less need for rural labor. If you live in a city and everyone goes to school and you have a middle class or working class job, rather than living on a farm and needing all the labor you can get, a family of 10 kids is not going to be as useful or as you know, easy to deal with as a family of two or three. Laws also came into play here. New laws that had been created during the Progressive Era, remember, ensured that kids would be required to attend school. That means that children go from being a cheap resource that can help make you money or keep you alive to being an expensive resource. They're there because you love them and you have an emotional attachment to them, not also because they can go out and help at haying season, right? So it's more expensive and less useful to have lots of kids. For all these reasons and more, we have a lower birth rate. In 1900, as it shows here, the average household had 3.82 children. By only 30 years later, an entire child has disappeared. That's a really short time for something that dramatic to happen in. Obviously, there's some rounding in these numbers, and I've run across slightly different estimates elsewhere, but in general, one kid per family disappears. And the measurement in 1930 is too late for the, sorry, too early for the uh, impact of the Depression to have played a role. So this is all during a period of somewhat economic prosperity. So bottom line here is these numbers suggest pretty strongly that more and more Americans were using birth control. And greater public attention to the topic helps make it more acceptable. The poster on the right advertises a debate not in Greenwich Village or Manhattan or LA, it's from Buffalo, New York. And simply using the term birth control, let alone talking about it on stage at a theater in Buffalo, was breaking the law. Nevertheless, birth control reformers persisted. Now, the movement for birth control at this time was spearheaded largely by female reformers. Most of them identified to some degree as feminist, although what that term meant at the time was often up for grabs. But advocates like Margaret Sanger, who you have probably heard of, and Mary Ware Dennett, who you probably had not prior to this, um, were regularly jailed for spreading information about birth control, sexuality, and basic knowledge. World War I, remember, had offered new opportunities to discuss issues like VD and birth control by claiming that it was in the interest of national public health, and reformers take advantage of this. So here we have a picture on the upper left of Margaret Sanger, surrounded by her staff, a nurse whose patients were largely working class and poor immigrant women in New York City. According to Sanger's own autobiography, she became a convert to the cause after treating, when she was a young nurse, treating a woman with a very large family who was told by her physician that she could not become pregnant again or it would likely kill her. The woman, a patient she gave the, the pseudonym of Sadie to, Sadie begged the doctor and Sanger, who was the nurse uh, working for him, to please tell her how to avoid having children, and the doctor would not give her that information because it was illegal. Sanger actually wondered if the doctor even knew. Um, this woman, then Sadie, became pregnant again, and the next and last time Sanger saw her patient, she was dying from a self-induced abortion. Sanger credited that with making her a reformer. Um, Sanger's promotion of birth control, which is a term she helped to popularize, would send her to jail, would send her fleeing to Europe to avoid prosecution. In 1916, she opened the country's first public clinic devoted to birth control. 
it's reproduced or the ad for it, the poster she put up around New York to appeal to potential patients is reproduced on the right. Let's take a look at some of the language here. First of all, it's in three different languages. English at the top, of course, the languages below you might recognize. One is Yiddish and then the bottom is Italian. That tells us right there that this clinic was intended to serve not only native English speakers, but the growing population of new immigrants, many from Eastern and Southern Europe, who would have understood those languages far better than English. Secondly, what did the clinic actually offer and to whom? You'll note, and I've reproduced this in larger type on the left, it appeals to mothers, not to women or women who could potentially be pregnant or even to wives, Obviously, appealing openly to single women would have not gone over very well. But it reaches out to mothers asking them, do you want more children? In other words, it assumes they already have children. Why would that be? The assumption here, and Sanger was pretty savvy about this sort of thing, is that women who did not have children would have widely been regarded as shirking their duty. So by limiting her clientele to women who were not only married, but who were already mothers, usually mothers of multiple children, she hoped to sort of dodge that particular charge, that she could argue there was a moral difference between helping a woman um, control her fertility after she'd had two or three or five children, instead of helping her control it from the beginning, because that would be wrong. So it is relying on a notion of uh, women who are already maternal. Secondly, you'll notice that it sets up birth control in opposition to abortion. Do not kill, do not take life, but prevent. So what Sanger's Clinic and others like it would offer were primarily um, access to prescriptions for diaphragms or cervical caps, rubber devices that covered a woman's cervix to prevent sperm from inseminating a woman and in starting a pregnancy. Sanger believed, and she was probably right, that these were the best option, not only because they were medically safe and effective, they weren't going to hurt you, and they worked pretty well, but also, and this is crucial, because they were a method of birth control that was controlled by women themselves. You did not have to get your partner's permission. Your partner might not even know that you were wearing a diaphragm or a cervical cap. If they were observant, they'd probably figure it out. But she believed that uh, birth control was, as she wrote early in her life, the moral property of women, that only they had the right to control their own fertility. And that brings us to Mary Ware Dennett, who we're going to look at for the last couple minutes. Uh, you've read a little bit about her. Uh, she's a less well-known reformer. And as you know from the reading, she was well off, educated, active in artistic and political reform movements. And she took on birth control as a very unpopular but important to her topic in the early 20th century. Some of this may have been related to her own history. She had a history of high risk pregnancies, uh, one resulting in a stillbirth, and was ill for years after her third and final pregnancy before having an operation to repair a ruptured uterus. This was a not uncommon side effect of multiple pregnancies and births close together. She placed great faith in not only giving women access to birth control, but in really making sure that everyone, boys as well as girls, learned early on, no young people in the title of this pamphlet, learned early on how their bodies worked. She thought that if couples had access to birth control, they could marry younger, they would, um, this would eliminate or cut back on venereal disease, and that it would lead to happier families because couples could plan their futures. It, it would encourage planned births rather than putting stress on women's health and families' financial resources. So Dennett founds a group called the National Birth Control League in 1915, uh, later turns into a series of other organizations. And what I want us to look at for the last minute or so we have is the document you read for today. You'll note that she writes it as a letter to a daughter and then surrounds it by her own testimony. By coming up with a personal and very sentimental situation in which this fictitious daughter has a sick husband who lost his job, has four kids already, she's really kind of stacking the deck in favor of sympathy for birth control. She argues ultimately that the Comstock laws were wrong, that women needed birth control, 
that Americans were ignorant and embarrassed, and that pamphlets like this were necessary. So bottom line, middle-class women by the 20s are far more likely than ever before to use birth control. We'll pick up... A